I'm Ted. I'm an alcoholic. Amen. All right, first of all, before we get started, is there anybody out there that's got uh, something pressing hard and heavy on their soul and their heart? And if so, let's, uh, let's get that out there right now. Anyone? All right, didn't think so. All right, hey, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's a pleasure. Very grateful. Brian, thank you so much for, uh, for asking me to do this. Um, like we always say, it's, it's an honor uh, and a privilege uh, to be asked to do things uh, for Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, to be given the opportunity to share uh, my experience, strength, and hope, my story, if you will, again, is, uh, is something that uh, is bestowed, has been bestowed upon me for which uh, I will forever, and I can't say enough, forever be privileged and, and grateful to do so. So, I uh, was born in 1970, January 28th, in Wilson, North Carolina. Um, grew up uh, a little bit in Wilson, a little bit in Richmond, Virginia, but I uh, my roots, I call my roots here in North Carolina, up in a little city called Lenore, North Carolina. Uh, moved around quite a bit at a young age. Um, come from a really big family, uh, a, big, a big family, military family, business family. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, a lot of, uh, lot of love, a lot of, uh, a lot of caring, uh, just a lot of happiness. You know, I remember that uh, early on in my childhood, Growing up was just was just what everybody seems to think that, that the right way to grow up. In other words, my childhood was wonderful. I mean, I had an absolute blast uh, growing up. Uh, again, I can't say enough for the way my family uh, raised me uh, and the time that I spent with my family. Uh, however, with that being said, us Lanier's have a long history of, uh, of substance abuse. Uh, uh, alcoholism and with respect to AA, uh, some, some drug issues as well. Uh, however, the odd thing about my family and, and the environment that I was raised in, we were always high-functioning uh, alcoholics and addicts, if you will. Uh, my father, uh, who is my best friend to this day, um, he uh, was a high-functioning alcoholic. So at an early age, his brothers, uh, uncles, my uncles, and his brothers, my uncles, grandparents, drinking was part of our family. Uh, and I was introduced to it at a young age, not that I was ever handed anything, but I remember going behind at parties and me and my sister would find this. And you know, we always talk about how the first, there's, there's so many firsts in our, uh, uh, our active addiction, if you will. And the funny thing is, all the damage that I've done to myself, I remember most all the firsts. Um, uh, and primarily uh, the first when it comes to uh, uh, to alcohol, uh, and I don't think that I don't think it was a catalyst at a young age that, that set me off in the path to where I ultimately ended up. However, I do think it started the foundation. But like I said, along with that, there was uh, family was was wonderful, um, and I knew early on what alcoholism was. My father, again, I remember he, you know my mother would always tell me she's like. Son, you be careful, you got that alcoholic gene in you, you know, and I'm like, what does that mean, you know? <laughs> so I was always warned by my mother, which by the way is a saint. Um, I think I was asked one time when I was down in treatment, uh, we had to des describe certain characteristics about our families, <coughs> and you know, that we had to find the good and bad in all of them. And when it came to my mother, you know, I remember my counselors were like, well, you forgot one here. I was like, no, I didn't. I said, if there's ever a saint, it's my mother. And I just, I just could not bring myself to write anything negative down because there just isn't nothing negative. So my point is this, you know, my mother was always, she was always there and she would always warn me of my, you know, my father's actions and how, and his brothers and everybody else in our family, how it could affect me if I was not careful. You know, I look back on that now and, you know, did I believe it? Yeah, I did. Uh, I, I think I tried to to I tried to listen to her advice early on, uh, but you know eventually I uh, I threw caution to the wind. I just I just I didn't I didn't listen to it anymore. I was like, sure, it's not going to happen to me. Uh, and you'll see as as we get into this, it gets pretty uh, it's pretty rough. So with that being said, you know again, <clears throat> life was wonderful. Uh, I went on and grew up, did the same thing that most all of us in, in here have done. We grow up, we go to school. We either, we either play sports, we're involved in stuff. And everything, everything that I ever did, I, try, I learned from my father. One of the biggest things I got from my father was, despite the fact that he had some unfortunate events when it comes to alcoholism, 
he was always a high performer. No matter what, he always succeeded. You know, my father was never a, a mean drunk. We always called him a dumb drunk because my father was the kind of guy that would get drunk and he would just fall asleep. You know, so there was never any violence. Uh, there was there was nothing like that. Even with you know other extended families, uh, extended families, immediate families, there, there was never any violence. It was just a big happy thing in our family. Uh, and I thought, you know, why does my mom always tell me, son, you better be careful. You don't have that alcoholic gene in you. Um, but again, uh, it was just part of what we did. Um, but I, the one thing that stood out in my mind was the fact that my father was very successful. And I remember at an early age, he, was, uh, he had lost a job. Uh, he was vice president of Bank of Virginia. Uh, and, it, and I was young at the time, and I couldn't understand why we went from where we were to my father being a chemical salesman, door-to-door -door chemical salesman. But I would tell you this, despite his, his addiction, he was the best man door-to-door -door chemical salesman that there was. And I saw this, this, this transition in my father all my life. And, and again, what I'm getting at is this high functionality. So we fast forward a little bit, I get into high school, and I I'm, was really good at a young age, uh, as well as in the high school, in athletics. I loved athletics. Uh, primarily, I found my love uh, for football. Uh, and I, you know, and I just thought to myself, you know, maybe this is, you know, if I just do what my dad has always told me, despite what he does wrong, I will be okay until I picked up the first drink and until I picked up the first, with respect to alcoholics and violence, until I picked up that first drug. And, and this started for me early on. And the thing about, the thing about addiction for me is, and we hear it all the time, I, you know, when I say I liked what it did, I really liked what it did to me. I mean, I, there's, there, there's a lot of things I've done in my life that, that brought me happy and pleasure. And I'm going to tell you right now, what alcohol and drugs did for me was the most amazing thing in the world. And I thought, how am I going to be able to do this and be like my father and be like the other men in my family? Well, if I'm going to be good at anything, I'm also going to be good at my addiction. Uh, and, and I set forth on a path to be the best at not only everything I did, but to be the best uh, at my addiction. Um, you know, I, would, I remember would play uh, would play football for years and years and years, um, and we would, we would I would you know mixing that with with uh, with active addiction, with drinking and the partying, and, and it didn't stop me because as long as I could just look at myself in the mirror, no matter what I did bad when it came to addiction, as long as I was successful professionally. It was okay. And you're going to see, I like to talk about this thing called a personal life and a professional life. And I talk about this a lot when people, when I speak with others and, and some other things I've been involved with. My life came to a point in my mid-teens where I started to realize that I have these two lives. I have a professional life and a personal life. And to be honest with you, I put more effort into my professional life and less effort into my personal life. And... Little did I know that that was going to be uh, the beginning of, a, of a, an extremely rough road. Um, so anyways, um, time goes by. Um, uh, in my early teens, um, things progressed to a level that it shouldn't progress for a teenager. Um, and my personal life started to plummet while I was still able to maintain that professional life. And I know as crazy as that sounds, it did not matter what I did to myself or what I did to others, what I did to friends and what I did to the people that I love, as long as I was good at my profession at that moment, I didn't care what I did to anyone, primarily myself. Uh, and for the longest time, I, I, I tried to figure out why I was like that. Nowadays, I do know why. Um, Time goes on, uh, and it's, you know, high school's running out, you know, and, and, and I'm getting ready to graduate. And all those football scholarships that were, that were offered to me, I chose not to take them, and I chose to do other things. Um, I had uh, three or four football scholarships straight out of high school, and uh, I chose to do <coughs> the wrong thing. You know, I chose my, uh, I, I chose not to focus on that professional life for that one instant, and it cost me everything that I had worked for up until that point. 
Uh, and I think what that did was it started a whirlwind uh, of addiction. Uh, a lot of trouble with law enforcement. I uh, was thrown out of my house. Um, you know, you, you say at 19 years of age or 18 years of age, I've lost everything. And, and at 18 years of age, you know, what did I lose? I lost, I lost the roof over my head. And as badass as I thought I was, and it sucked when you didn't have no place to live, especially when you knock on the door and nobody would answer. You know? So, so and, I, and, I, and I'll never forget, I thought to myself, there is absolutely no way that I'm going to live like this. I'm going to do something to make my life better. Well, the only thing I knew how to do was to find a profession because I certainly didn't know what to do alone without one. Uh, I'll never forget, I'd, uh, I had induced certain... Um, certain substances, uh, had a rough night and was taken to the emergency room. Uh, i never forget, I checked myself out the next day. And again, like I said, I'd been thrown out of the house. What little an 18 year old could have, I didn't have no more. Uh, and I'll never forget, I walked, I walked home and I knocked on the door. My dad answered the door and he says, what do you want? And I said, dad, take me to the recruiting station. Uh, so in 1988, 89, I joined the military. And I thought, this is it, I finally found what, I finally found something that's going to allow me to be that successful guy that I used to be. And again, I say used to be, I'm still a teenager, but you know, sometimes we, we, we live fast when we're young and, we, and we, we have to grow up a lot faster than a lot of folks around us. So I joined the military and I thought to myself, okay, this is it. You know, I, I, I've, I've beat that demon. I now have this, this professional. This is where I feel comfortable, where I need to be in a professional status. Uh, and, and so, so my military career began. Along with that military career uh, began an overabundance of, uh, of alcohol abuse. Uh, the, uh, the other substances and things of that nature tapered off. For those of you that are familiar with the military, any type of government work, they have this thing called a urinalysis. And I was not gonna, I was not gonna let something as, as simple as that take me away from my chosen profession. <laughs> From the moment that I raised my right hand and put that uniform on, I knew right then and there I absolutely had found my dream job. I absolutely loved the military. Uh, throughout my 20s, um, was nothing, uh, it, was, it was nothing but, but work and play, work and play. And again, we talk uh, in the military, you know, you talk about a bunch of guys that, that like to play hard and party hard. Let me tell you something, we, uh, we defined it. Um, uh, we, we really defined it, and it was acceptable. Uh, it was acceptable. There was times where you were expected to drink. You know, you, you by no means was I ever going to be the one that says, no, it's okay, I'll have a Coke. No, it wasn't happening. Yeah, you know, and, and again, not that anybody held a gun to your head and made you drink, but again, there's this thing in the military called the chain of command, and the person that outranks you, if he's going to hand you something to drink, I suggest you take that drink and drink. So again, that's just kind of the way it was. But but again, I never I never thought anything about it because because once again, no matter how how bad it got on a weekend or a weeknight or at a party or at a at a, at a military ball, as long as I showed up the next day and performed, I did not care what I did to myself and anybody else in my personal life. So here we go again. There's that personal and professional life. You know, I once had a first sergeant. Uh, a first sergeant is in the military is a uh, a senior non-commissioned officer, and uh, we, we were having a formation one day, and there was some guys out there, and I, and I can remember standing in formation, if those of you with any military experience knows that I've been in formation before, and the guy behind me has got his hand on my back, so I'm not falling out, you know, because we've been partying all night. We're getting ready to run 20, 10, 20 miles, or whatever, PT in the morning. And this one particular morning, there was a lot of guys out there that were just, you know, in bad, bad shape, and I'll never forget, this guy's name was William B. McHugh, he's an old Vietnam veteran. And he looked at us and he said, and you want to talk about putting gas on a fire. He looked at the, at the formation and said, let me tell you something. And I won't use all the explicatives he used. He said, uh, he said, let me tell you guys something. If you were going to, and I quote, if you're going to stay out and hoot with the owls, you had best be able to damn soar with the eagles. And once again, I'm off to the races. So you mean to tell me I can drink as much as I want and all I got to do is show up and perform every day? I'm on that. I can do that. And I did it for 22 and a half years. 22 and a half years I did that. And you know, you think to yourself, there's gotta be more out there that motivates you to be successful. And there was, and there, and there still is to this day. However, 
when I started this split in my life with the personal and the professional side of things, I had a pass. And I had the green, I had, I had the green light. I mean, and, and it, it was ingrained in my mind that no matter what I do when it comes to consumption of alcohol, as long as I, I perform and show up, I'm good to go. And that was probably the worst thing you could, little did I know then, I know now, that was probably the worst thing, the worst advice I could have ever uh, been given. So early on in my 20s, I, was, uh, I got married. Um, I got married to a uh, lovely woman. Uh, her father was retired military. Um, I've been married to her now for, God, thank God, for 25 years. Uh, we have, I have a son through a previous relationship and two children uh, with my wife now. Wonderful children. Um, got married early in 92. Uh, and, and it's funny that we, we talk about, we talk about you know, the, the drinking aspect of things. I think for, I think uh, I proposed to her at a keg party one night or something. Just imagine that, you know, it, exactly, it was the day after Valentine's Day. Who does that? You know, this, this, this alcoholic does, that's who does it. And I think we spent our wedding day uh, roller skating, ice skating, bar hopping, oh, floating the keg, and then, uh, then you know, what, what, what two young couples do uh, late at night, you know, with all the funny gifts everybody thinks they should give everybody. So, so that's kind of how my wedding went. <clears throat> but again, but it was great. It was awesome. You know, we've been married for 25 years. Uh, I can honestly say that, that um, other than my children, my wife is probably the best thing that has ever happened to me. Um, and by the grace of God, she has still to this day stuck with me. Uh, and I'll get to something here in a minute that, uh, that, that most people, most ladies out there would, would have never put up with. And, and again, I, I just can't say enough about it. I'll get to that in just a second. But um, so yeah, so through my 20s, um, life is good. I'm in the military. I'm PCS, you know, I'm, I'm changing my station from Germany back to the States about every three years. Uh, I'm in charge of my career. You know, back in those days I could call our, our our branch manager, if you will, in, in DC and say, hey man, I'm coming up on my time, you know, here's where I want to go. So I, I controlled my career everywhere I went. Uh, and again, it's with this notion of, I, you know, I'm going to get what I want when I want it because I have this professional life and I don't care who I have to screw over or who I have to steamroll to get it. Uh, and I, I apply that in just about every facet uh, of my life. Uh, you know, things, gosh, I could go over deployments and, and combat and all that stuff and that was all part of the military career however there's there's one thing I, I do want to to bring up and again uh, with with the utmost respect to Alcoholics Anonymous we talked about first uh, early on when I started uh, and, and this is gonna this is gonna tie into what I've got to say here in a minute I remember the first time I had to have dental surgery back in the early early 90s late 80s prior to going to Desert Storm and I was given a a, an opiate pain medication, uh, and I remembered it. Never ever forgot the day I took it, what it made me feel like, and what I was wearing, where I was, and I also liked the fact how it worked well with alcohol. <laughs> Time goes on, it happened again in 95 when I broke my ankle. Another taste of, the, uh, of those medicines. And then again, it happened again in, in the year 2000. And again, I, I feel as if I should bring this up because it is a part of my story just as much as alcoholism is. Uh, because I'm dual diagnosed, you know, I'm commonly what they refer to as a trash can. If it's going to get me a buzz, I'm going to take it, <laughs> and I'm not scared of nothing. Um, so anyway, so you've got those three firsts. Um, so the year 2000 rolls around, um, and that was my third time taking these, these, these uh, substances along with copious amounts of alcohol on a day-to-day -day basis. Once again, still maintaining that professional life. Uh, and then we, as we all know, um, all right, let me back up a second. In 90 and 99, I volunteered for uh, Special Forces Assessment Selection. Uh, I had done everything I could do in the conventional army, and I wanted to do something bigger. My father uh, has a, 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 a special operations background, uh, Vietnam. I've got a couple other uncles and, and cousins and whatnot that have dabbled in, in that arena, but I wanted, to be, I wanted to be the best. I wanted to be the one. I wanted to follow in their footsteps. And I wanted something different because I had reached a point where I was tired and bored with what the regular or the conventional army had to offer. So in 99, I decided to join the Special Forces and I was, I, I made it. Uh, shortly thereafter, the towers fell and it was game on. 
Not only was it game on for my profession, but it was really game on for my personal life. Because from the year 2000 up until June 16th of 2017, I stayed on, the, uh, on an opiate prescription. Uh, and that's just the legal side of things. Uh, it's a lot worse when it comes to the, illegal, the, the other illegal stuff. So 9-11 happens, uh, and, and bam, we're off to the races. You know, I thought, this is it. This is the pinnacle of my life. Um, I get to go over and do what had been done to us, and I get to do it with the most incredible amount of violence of action that you could possibly even begin to imagine. And I loved every second of it. Um, and I, 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 lit, I loved every minute of it. Um, the career continues, my personal life continues to collapse. Along with this, I, I developed an insatiable appetite for infidelity. Um, and it was a part, of, it's a part of my story, it's a part of my addiction. Uh, there was a lot of things that I like to induce, but yet there was a, another uh, insatiable appetite for infidelity, uh, of which lasted probably a couple of years after I got married and didn't stop uh, until a year and a half ago. Uh, when my wife of 25 years in December of 2016 had asked me for a divorce uh, because my, my demons had finally caught up with me. Um, so backing up just a little bit, the uh, time goes on. Uh, I'm, I'm doing the deal. I'm going overseas. I'm working all the time. I'm always gone trying to raise kids. I'm not much of a father at all. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Um, I'm not there for my daughter, who is now 24 years old. Uh, she, would, she would get scared of me when I would come home. And then when I would finally warm up to her, I would go off, uh, consume copious amounts of alcohol and other substances, and then she would be scared of me. So I was a horrible, horrible father. Um, she says otherwise, um, maybe she remembers things that I don't, but me personally, I did things that a father is not supposed to do. Did I provide for him? Yes, I did. I, I, I provided, but what I didn't provide that I know now was that emotional support uh, that my daughter so desperately needed. And thank God she has, she's just fine. Uh, she is married. Her husband's in the military and they're overseas in Germany and they're loving life. Um, but again, I just, I just was not there. I was there, but I was not there. One of the things that I started to realize around about 2004, 2005, was some psychological issues that I was dealing with. And now you start to compound addiction with untreated uh, psychological disorders, post-traumatic stress, things of that nature. You are really starting to become a time bomb that eventually is going to explode and explode it did. Um, the, uh, the, the career aspect of things was going uh, great, uh, and again, my personal life was, was, was still diving at a, uh, an alarming rate. I'm coming up on, uh, I'm coming, coming up on close to retirement uh, now, and it's about 2000, 2008, 2009, I'm starting to think, you know, I think I'm at the end of my run, uh, it's about time for me to, uh, to, to pop out, pop smoke, and, and do something different. And I, it had gotten to the point where, you know, I thought I'd, I had accomplished everything that I'd ever set out to do. Um, but I was scared because I knew once I left the military, I was going to lose that professional status that I, that I speak about often and have to deal with the, uh, the, uh, the aspect of personal life, which scared me to death. Uh, dealing with personal things be it family, dealing with myself, scared me to death. And, and just another reason why I inundated myself with addiction, uh, because I could not handle it any other way. I just, I just could not, couldn't do it. I didn't want to do it because nobody was going to tell me what to do. Uh, because we, we talk about we live with, with no consequences. You know, in the military, one of the things I did, I'd, I'd attain rank uh, very quickly. And I, I'd attained, a, I retired at a, at a uh, so it's, you need a master sergeant, uh, and again, that's, that's it's pretty high. It's, it's pretty, kind of an accomplishment, um, but nobody was going to tell me what to do. Nobody was going to tell me what to do. I, I tell this story often. There was a uh, towards the end of my career. There was we had a guy that ran our unit urinalysis, uh, and, and here's where I knew things started to get really crazy with uh, with my addiction. One day, uh, there was there was word of a, of a urinalysis, and I'd always been smart about the things that I took. Um, be it legal and illegal, um, 
you see in special operations, there's there's a lot of there's. I, I hate to use this term, but they call it big boy rules. You know, with, you've got the regular army discipline rules and regulations and uniform code of military justice. You have that in the special operations. However, we're a little bit older guys. We can get away with a little bit more stuff. Uh, and again, I'm not trying to discredit that. However, it's the truth because we are senior dudes uh, and we can get away with more things. Um, and if anybody out there with any experience in that area knows, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Well, what do I do? I take advantage of that. Now, one of the biggest things I did that, uh, that was one of the major turning points um, was uh, there was word of a urinalysis one day. And I'll never forget this. I walked uh, into the guy's office. He was just a young E5 sergeant. And I outranked him incredibly as well as time and just you know, older and, and everything. He was nothing to me. He was just a subordinate. Uh, and I flat out, and I'd been doing some things that I shouldn't have been doing. I'd been inducing some things that I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt I could not beat. Uh, and I just, I'd gotten lazy. I'd, gotten, I'd slipped up. Uh, and I went into his, uh, into his little office one day, and I told him, I said, hey, man, I hear we're having a, a urinalysis coming up. He said, yeah. And I said, uh, and, you know, he was a hard, he was excited. That was, that was his additional duty. He loved doing that stuff. You know, he, he loved doing it. You know, deep down inside, I hated him for it. But he had to do it. And I looked at him, and I told him, I said, let me tell you something. If you put me on that list, I will kill you and everybody in your family. And I meant it. I meant it. You see, I said those things because I'd gotten to a point in my life where nobody was going to take away what I wanted. I lived with no consequences. If I wanted something, I was going to take it. And if you got in my way, I was going to steamroll you in a heartbeat. And there was nothing that was going to stop me. My addiction had gotten so bad out of control that I was not going to let somebody with as little rank as him and time and service as him, and look at me, this big badass that, uh, that has done all these great things all over the world, I'm not going to let it happen. What's going to happen? I'm going to kill you and everybody in your family. Same people don't say things like that. We don't. You know, we, we don't. That, that, you know, I, I've since talked to this guy, and we've, I've made amends. Um, but, you know, I look back on that and I think to myself just how sick I was. And I thought about it for a little while and eventually just kind of went away. And I just, again, look at me. Look what I just did. I'm a badass and can't nobody stop me. Uh, time goes on and I retire. Once I retire, I thought, I've got to find something that's going to keep me in the fold, something that's going to keep me around other men of the caliber in which I've been used to working with for so many years. So I got into contracting. And I thought the world revolved around me. I thought the Army was going to fail the second I walked out of those doors and I retired. And, and I, I, I soon found out that that was not the case. Um, and I'm a guy that, that uh, started living without any structure. You see, the military gave me structure. Football gave me structure. The military gave me structure. And because of that structure, I was able to maintain that professional life. But I had no structure in my personal life. And again, I did what I wanted to do. Um, and things got worse when I retired. Now you've got a guy, I'm retired. Uh, I'm working for companies, I don't, making anywhere from six, eight hundred thousand dollars a day, and I've got one of the, and, I, and I've got an addiction, and I've got a bad addiction. Uh, but once again, I didn't let that stop me from doing what I knew was right, uh, because I had to make sure everybody else knew that, that I was there was nothing wrong with me, and that I was better than you, uh, and I could do things better than you, uh, and that my life was just wonderful. Um, meanwhile. The, the trail of destruction I had left uh, was, was indescribable. Um, the addictions, uh, the alcoholism just continued to grow and grow, just grew like a cancer. I mean, you know, and we always talk about we get to the point where you know, we just can't stop in and, and terms like blackout and, uh, and things like that. I just, I just could not stop. I just could not stop. Now I'm starting to regret retiring. Now I'm starting to regret why I didn't do certain things on certain diplomas. Now I'm starting to wonder why this guy, not me. You know, why, why I'm starting to wonder why did I have to take this life in this manner instead of taking a life in this manner, you know? Because when it comes to killing, you know, my father told me a long time ago, he said, son, I'm gonna tell you right now, he said, killing's easy, it's living with it's the hard part. And, that, and, that, and that's so very true. You see, there's some things that I did overseas that um, they're horrible. I don't regret any of them, 
with the exception of two cases. Uh, and I'll, I'll refrain from going into too much detail. And again, I further learned when I went to treatment on how to deal with those issues. But I didn't have that brotherhood to fall back on. Um, and it started getting bad. Uh, it started getting even worse. I couldn't hold a job. Uh, my job performance started to slack off. And then I would have to find something else that would fill the void that regular legal legal drugs and, and alcohol wasn't doing. And now that turned me into the world of, uh, of illegal narcotics. And again, much respect for Alcoholics Anonymous, but again, it is part of my story. Um, so for a while, I was able to, to, to pick up the pieces from that. I started another company uh, with some other guys. Uh, and eventually, things started to, seem, started to turn around. I was offered a job where I am now to this day on Fort Bragg uh, as a shooting instructor. And I thought, you know, maybe this is it. Maybe, uh, maybe I can finally get back into the fold and, and, and do, do what I've always liked to do, work around other guys in the special operations community. But by the time 2015 had rolled around, I was too far gone. Um, I thought I was holding it together, and I wasn't. Um, and roughly about, in about 2016, uh, my wife asked me for a divorce. And of course, me being the, the professional liar uh, that I have always been, um, I looked at what are you talking about? I said, you, you're crazy. What, I, you know, I, I figured I'd lie because I'd lied about it two other times that I'd been caught and got away with it. Why not lie again? And at this time, my wife pulls out a, a manila folder and uh, she pulls out this manila folder and she says, uh, she said, here's a, several thousand megabytes of digital evidence that says otherwise. And I knew right then and there she had me. She had me. She had me. Uh, I had had a relationship with another woman for 12 years, and I've been married for 25. Uh, she found out everything all my, she found out everything about my ex extensive, well, she knew about the alcohol, but she found everything about uh, my drug abuse, both legal and illegal. Um, and I started to fall apart. You see, I'm working at a place, you're, you're looking at a guy that went from making decisions and assisting individuals making decisions at the national level to a junkie, to a guy that couldn't even tie his shoes in the morning without taking a drink. They couldn't even get up out of bed without inducing some type of a drug. Just couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It had, it had, it had literally rolled me over more times than I could possibly imagine. Suicide was, uh, was a common thought in my life. Two failed attempts. Um, I, I woke up. I'll just put it that way. I woke up. Uh, my son had caught me one night. Uh, I'd had about four inches of a six inch barrel shoved down my throat and you know, a bottle of Jack Daniels or a bottle of liquor on the other side of my mouth. And all I wanted to do was die. But I was too chicken shit to pull the trigger. You know, I was too scared. Too scared. So I would try to take the easy way out. And do it silently. You know, I couldn't do it. Tried twice, couldn't do it. Each time I woke up, you know, and I don't know. I don't. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that was the hand of God. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that it was fat. I don't know what it was. All I know is it didn't happen. But I do know this: it wasn't supposed to happen. I'm glad it didn't. Um, by this time, thoughts of suicide, suicidal ideations, untreated PTS, um, psychological disorders have ravaged me. I don't know what to think. I don't know how to think anymore. And I'm barely holding on to my job, barely holding on. Uh, and finally, uh, after my wife had asked me for a divorce, those holidays were miserable. February time frame comes around and I went to work uh, and I, I woke up one morning and I was tired. Uh, and I've spoken about this before in some other, uh, some other instances. I wasn't tired like I was sleepy tired, I was tired. Something happened to me sometime in February that told me I was done. And if I If I didn't get help, I was going to die. Whether it would have been by my hand, or a drink, or a drug, I don't know. But I was done. I was absolutely done. I was finished. You know, I, you know, a lot of your, a lot of your illegal substances out there uh, that plague uh, 
all of us, some of us, uh, and, and here in America were, were forefront in my mind in every single waking moment of my life. And I was finished. I was absolutely finished. I had run hard for, gosh, I don't know, 30 years, considering my teenage years. Because I, I, I'm a guy that's, I'm either, I'm either in or I'm out. And, uh, cover that in <laughs> Uh, I'm either I'm either stopped or I'm 100 miles an hour. You know I'm not just gonna I'm not just gonna have one drink. I'm gonna have a hundred. I'm not just gonna do one drug. I'm gonna have as much as I want, and I'm gonna stack them. And I'm gonna do whatever it takes to get to where I want to be, uh, because it, it amps a guy up like me. I'm an amped up kind of guy, and I just love what it did to me. All of them were uppers to me. Everything was booze. All of it. It just amped me up, and I loved it. But eventually that had stopped, uh, and it was killing me. Um, so I, uh, where I work, I was, uh, I, I tell this story often, I'll never forget, I was working with some guys, was doing some shooting instructions for the first time in my life. I went to draw stroke my pistol and I couldn't pull the trigger. For 30, for the first time in 30 years, I couldn't do my job. I couldn't drop the hammer. And that hurt. That hurt more than anything in this world because I knew at that moment, that professional life and that personal life that I talk about had finally collided. It had finally smashed, and when it collided, it was probably one of the, it was, it, I can't, even to this day, I can't describe the feeling that I had. I don't know, there was feeling of relief, there was feeling of fear, there was feeling of dread. I mean, it was just, it was there, and it collided. And I'll never forget, I took my gun belt off, and I went up top of where I work, and I told a, a certain few people, and these people that, that I talked to and worked for, I had put some of them through the course that I'm an instructor at now, I've been on teams with them, I've been in gunfights with them, been all over the world with them. And I told them I needed help and I needed it now. And that, uh, that I, was, I, was, I was a bona fide 100% alcoholic drug addict. Make no mistake about it. Uh, you could look the thing up and I felt as if I could see my face in there. Uh, and, and it was scary. It was the most scariest thing I ever did and I absolutely fell apart. The good thing about it is, is I was not gonna be BC. I've never quit anything in my life. Um, and I figured I've made this move, I've asked for this help, I'm gonna attack this like I've ever attacked everything uh, in my professional life. <clears throat> With the notion and the feeling of wanting to improve my personal life. So um, fast forward a little bit, uh, I had to go to treatment. I had to go somewhere. I was taken off the, the committee that I work on. I had all my guns taken away from me. I had all my security access taken away from me. I had all my security codes taken away from me. I had everything taken away from me, and I was set in a, an operations center, and I did administrative work. The good thing is I had 120% by my chain of command the whole way through, and the reason is is because I came forward and asked for help. Um, and I know that sounds, I don't want to make that sound like it was easy, but that was probably one of the hardest decisions I ever had to make in my life. It was a very humbling experience. Uh, so again, I thought, so now what do I do? I've made this step, and I've got to go somewhere. I've got to hold my end of the bargain. I was able to stop using certain things for a while. Uh, there was certain things that I could not stop, uh, and I was just hanging on by a thread. I found this place called Warrior's Heart. You know, I had to go somewhere where I could be around, you know, other guys that suffered from the same things that I suffered from. Uh, addiction, number one. Untreated post-traumatic stress disorder, psychological disorders, because I had them all. I had every one of them. And I found this wonderful place down in Bandera, Texas called Warrior's Heart. And I'm gonna tell you right now, the, uh, you know, I often talk about, I've never heard the voice of an angel until I called and spoke to uh, administrations and admissions. And instead of asking me a bunch of questions, the lady asked me, she said, uh, or she told me, she said, uh, all I want you to do is talk and I'll get you where you need to be. No questions asked. <laughs> and I knew right then and there, I knew right then and there that, uh, that there was hope for a, uh, for a person like me because I didn't think there was any hope for me. I thought I was damaged goods. I didn't think there's no way in this world I could ever recover from what I, what I had done, the evil that I had done the horrible things that I'd done to myself and my family. But boy, was I, was I wrong. Uh, so I get down there, um, about a month into it. Um, you know, let me back up a second. I told my wife, I said, listen, I've realized that I've ruined everything that we've held sacred together. 
I realized you went out of this, and I don't blame you. I would, too. I said, please let me go somewhere to get straightened up. And when I come back, I will set you up for success for the rest of your life. Um, and that was that. I went away, and about a month into it, I get a phone call. She's like, Teddy, I want to give this another shot. Uh, so she became greatly involved in my recovery via uh, video teleconferencing, uh, and we were able to, uh, to rebuild our marriage. It's not rebuilt. It's going to continue to take time because I've got to gain a lot of trust back. And that doesn't happen over a year or a year or some change or how long it's been since I've been out of there. It's a lifetime commitment. Some of the things that I learned down there at Warrior's Heart were how to deal with untreated PTS, uh, symptoms of mild traumatic brain injury, uh, psychological disorders, and primarily addiction. Um, the, the piece that I learned about addiction down there was probably one of the most amazing things I'd ever learned. I, I finally understood where my father had gone, and I understood what it meant, and I understood that you know my mom was right. I had that gene in me, and it just took its time for it to manifest, for it to finally come out in full-blown addiction, and it, and it did. It did so many years ago, and I just refused to believe that. <clears throat> I went down to Warrior's Heart, I stayed down there, I kept extending and extending because I just wasn't ready to come back yet. Um, and I finished up, and sometime in June, I think it was June last year, June 21st, I sat right there with Michael sitting. Um, had a couple guys in mind that had been given, names that had been given to me for a sponsor. Um, and I came in here and I saw this individual, and I figured, well, out of the three names I was given, he's the biggest dude in there, so I'm going to have to pick him because I'm not going to be able to steamroll him. Uh, and it's probably been one of the greatest decisions I've ever made, uh, the sponsor that I chose here. Um, so, so uh, you know, life, life starts over. You know, you're sheltered in, in, in treatment for so long, and now it's time to get out. It's time to start living this new life of recovery. Uh, and I'm, I'm here to tell you right now, early on, I thought, that how, can, how can all this be true? How can such a simple building such as this and amazing people such as everybody in here in such a small little blue book have so much knowledge and have the ability to change um, my life around. You know, despite all the other amazing help and amazing treatment that I received down at Warrior's Heart, um, dealing with some other issues, the addiction piece itself, without that, without what I was taught in Alcoholics Anonymous, all of that would have been wasted because I had to be clean and sober before I could use those tools that I was so graciously given to, to treat all the other uh, issues that I had in my head. Uh, I can honestly say that that all the, all the adages, all the, all the phrases, you know, just do AA and let's just do the deal. You know, we all talk about it in meetings, how I get tired of hearing that. But man, how true is that? You know, how, how, how true is that? You know, I one, I one time told myself, I was like, my sponsor tells me to do the deal one more time. I'm gonna do the deal, I'm gonna do the deal on his ass. But you know what, I kept doing the deal. <laughs> you know, I never thought that, I never thought recovery, I never thought I would pray as much as I do. I never thought I would listen to another man as much as I do. I never thought I would stand in front of another human being and convey to that human being some of the horrors that I have faced over my life. I never thought I would stand here at this podium and be uh, given the opportunity to, uh, to share my story with each and every one of you. And that's the, beauty of, uh, that's the beauty of Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the beauty of recovery. Because the gift that, you, that I've been given, that everybody in this room has been given, is something that, that, that can never be, it, it can never, it's, it's not tangible, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? Because everything, we're always wanting to, we always want this. We want stuff that's tangible. I want a coin. I want, you know, I want, I want a keychain. I want, I want as many, but, and, and those are great. Don't get me wrong. It's what we get in here. And how we use this is the most greatest gift that I, I could have ever possibly imagined. Possibly imagined. We talk about how our lives have turned around, everything's great. Yeah, things are great, but you know what? I still have shitty days, man. Everybody does. It's how I've learned how to deal with those days that makes the person. Because uh, without the tools that I've been given through Alcoholics Anonymous uh, and the tools that I was given, so graciously given down at Warrior's Heart, I would not have the capacity to uh, to be standing here today. I would, you know, quite frankly, I would not be I would not be alive. There's there's no there's no doubt in my mind. Um, 
the transition to sobriety has been has been amazing. I have been blessed with so many opportunities. Um, I work heavily uh, in recovery. Uh, I work with a lot of guys, sponsor guys, um, and I've I've learned all this through just being open-minded and just for once listening to somebody instead of making it my way instead of like I always like to say instead of staying I steamroll somebody to get what I want you know how about I just keep my mouth shut and listen and I've been told that a time or two too didn't like it but I was told it and and but I will say this probably one of the greatest and I said it earlier probably one of the greatest uh, bits of advice I was ever given because I asked a lot of questions in the beginning I'm like so you mean to tell me this is going to work yeah. Well, what if I, no? Just just do this. I said, she, you're telling me this is going to work. I said, yeah, man, it's going to work. He said, just check it out. It's real simple. Great man once told me this. He looked at me and said, hey, man. And he said it real soft and smooth. He looked at me and said, hey, bud. He said, either you're in or you're out. There ain't no gray area. And for a guy that lived in the gray area all his life, I took that to heart. Because, again, I'm either zero or 100 miles an hour. I'm either in or I'm either out. And that's probably some of the greatest advice I've ever given, uh, that I've ever been given. Um, the, uh, the, the benefits of family that I've noticed have just been incredible. Um, and they're, they're, they're just, we're build, I'm building memories now. Sometimes I get caught up in the fact that, that, that I lost the opportunity to do so many things, and I did, but I can't worry about that. Because one thing, another thing I've learned because I don't have yesterday, and I'm damn sure I ain't got tomorrow. All I have is right now. And for the first time in my life, it just it really feels good to be me. I'm comfortable in my own skin. You know, Ernest, Ernest Hemingway once wrote, he said, the world breaks everyone, but many of us at those breaking points become better because of it. And I think that holds real true to, to how I feel about a lot of things. Uh, it's what we do at those breaking points that defines us. And for the first time in my life, I can finally, I can finally look towards the sun and let my shadows cast behind me. Thank you so very much for allowing me to stand here in front of you guys tonight to share my story with you. Brian, again, I cannot thank you enough for asking me to do this. It has been an incredible, incredible honor. I am truly grateful to be here tonight. I'm truly grateful to be sober. Thank you very much.